Amen. Amen. Good to be with you all this morning. Can we make some noise for the guests that are with us today just to show our appreciation? Amen. We're very glad, very glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. We're in a sermon series that we're calling uh, Embodied. I almost forgot the title, Calling Embodied. Uh, Last week, we got into uh, how God created us. He created our bodies. He gives dignity to our bodies, and we should esteem our bodies in the way that he does. And you may have been able to tell this from the scripture reading, but today uh, we're going to be talking about gender from a biblical perspective. Uh, As we'll look to learn from some verses in Genesis chapter 2 and some verses in Genesis chapter uh, 1. So we're going to look into how God views gender and how the Bible talks about it, and then we'll uh, look at how men and women are equal, even though we are distinct uh, as well. If you've got a Bible, we'll start it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Again, Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 7. Let me go ahead and give you the, the disclaimer that I, I, I gave last week uh, as well, particularly to my uh, parents in the room throughout for today and throughout this sermon series. We're going to be getting into more and more uh, detail about things regarding sex, about things regarding uh, gender. If you're a parent in the room and you're considering whether or not you feel comfortable with your children being in the room as we talk about this, I want to give you a heads up just so you know, that just so you can make the decision that you believe is best. But again, my belief is that if the children in the room can understand the words that I am saying, Uh, then they're already being taught to some degree from the world about every single topic that I'm going to bring up throughout this sermon series. So I would recommend that you allow them to stay in the room. But of course, uh, that decision is yours. Won't be going into too much uh, detail uh, today, but did want to give you that heads up for today and for the remainder uh, of the series. Let's read verse 7, Genesis chapter 2. Reads, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So a bit of a recap from last week. God made the soul and the body of man together. So just like your soul, you might say your spirit is a part of who you are, so your body is a part of who you are as well. The, the, your body, and this is a misconception that some people have, the body is not a suit or a shell that you live in. Right, It's not that the real you is who you are internally and then your body is a shell that you live in. No, the body is as much a part of you as the unseen parts of you are. See, God got the dust, the physical material, and he blew his breath, the breath of God, into it. The Hebrew word for breath there is a word that it can also, and this is Old Testament and New Testament, is a word that can also be translated as spirit. So the sequence of verse 7 is God forms the man from the dust. And then breathes the man's spirit into him. And then we see the result of that at the end of verse 7, which is the man became a living creature. It's not like he made you and then came up with a body that you were going to live in. If you're actually looking at the sequence of what happens, it says that he formed the man of the dust. The, from the dust being the, being the physical, the tactile p- parts, the parts that we can see and touch and feel that you have. If you really want to get technical, it seems like the body is made first. When he says that and he made the man of the dust and then he breathes into the man and the man becomes alive. No, your body is a part of who you are. I know that some believe, that, again, the body is more of a suit or a house for the spirit or the, for our spirits, for our souls, but the text is simply doesn't communicate that, and that is crucially important for this series because the statement, I want you to consider this, that our bodies are a part of who we are, joined with our spirit, joined with our soul, and that the body is just as much a part of who we are as the unseen parts of us, has a lot of implications on how we should think about our gender. I know in the society we live in today, many people have a lot of different views about whether or not gender is binary. By binary, I mean you have one of two options. You're either male or female. I know many have a lot of different views on that. I'll I'll, I'll say this because I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that because I don't think that's actually the main focus of the passage that we'll be in today. But I'll say this. The Bible talks about gender in very binary terms. Very binary terms. 
You're this or you're that. You're male or you're female. I want to point to a couple verses to show you what I mean when I say that. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, one of the most commonly quoted verses when having this kind of a discussion. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Also in Jesus' ministry in Mark chapter 10, he's in a conversation. I believe the specific topic he's, he's talking about is divorce in this passage in Mark chapter 10, verse 6. He says, but from the beginning of creation, God created the male and female. The, the Old Testament words for man and woman are ish and isha, man and woman. First Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is addressing uh the Corinthian church, and he's talking to them about how genders are to view each other with their distinctions. And here's what he says. Nevertheless, in the Lord, women, woman is not dependent, is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is not born of woman, and all things are from God. So as he's going back and forth about how different genders are to perceive each other, you see, and this is the pattern throughout all the scripture, it's man and woman. I know that for many in our society, your quote unquote, your sex is indicated by your physical body, while your gender is often indicated by what you believe to be true of yourself on the inside. Consistently, I just want to say the Bible does not distinguish between the two as far as sex and gender. It talks about them as if they are the same thing, and that is the way that I will talk about them because that is what the Bible is leading us, um, or the perspective of the Bible is leading us. Uh, to have. When the Bible brings up different sexes or different genders, again, it's constantly in these binary terms that who you are on the inside is who you are on the outside. And they are united and formed, as we saw in the scripture, they are united and formed together in the creation of mankind. Now, there's going to be a sermon in the future where we talk a little bit more about how we live in a world that increasingly sees things in a way that's different from the way that I described. And if you have any specific questions about this, the last Sunday in this sermon series will be a Q&A, um, a question and answer session where I'll try to answer a lot of the questions, especially a lot of the questions uh, that are submitted. Can we go back to, to the last slide? Because I just want to make sure everyone sees uh, what we have, the last scripture. Uh, I don't know if you probably can't even see it from where you are, but you can text two notch along with your questions to 855-855-0655. Again, that is, if you can't see it, 855-855-0655. That's today. You can do it in the middle of a sermon. If there's something that you see, that you hear me say in a sermon, you got a question about it. If you think of something on Wednesday, if you think of something in your life group meeting, whenever, you can text it in. And especially the, if we get a lot of repeated questions, and we'll make sure we get to as many of those as we can during a Q&A session that we have at the end of this, because I do know this is not only a sensitive topic, but a topic where there are a lot of different views. And I, we want to, as uh, in, in a way that's as informed as possible, make sure that we are answering the questions that, uh, that, that you might have. Now, now, with that said, for today, I want us to focus in on what we can glean from what the Bible is saying in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 about men and women. Like, I want to be, begin to, to try to answer the question, what does it mean to be a biblical man and a biblical Woman, or to say it another way, how do we practice biblical masculinity and biblical femininity? If we're saying that God created man and woman, what does it look like for us to live into that as God has designed us to? So first, let me say this. To the brothers in the room, uh, if a brother would come to me and ask me, how do I practice biblical masculinity? How do I live that out? How do I be a biblical man? The first thing that comes to my mind to say is, you see what the Bible says to all Christians to do? Do that. What the Bible calls you to do, do it. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Look to grow in that. Love people as yourself. Do these things. There's, there's not a whole lot of, of commands in the Bible that just apply to men and just apply to women. There's more overlap than there is difference. There's more similarity than there is distinction in the Bible as far as how we are to live. So the first and foremost, understand the Bible, know who God is, understand him, and seek to live in the way that he calls us to live. That's the primary way you live as a biblical man. To my sisters in the room, if you were to ask me, how do you practice biblical femininity? Find out what God calls Christians to do. See what the Bible says and do that. Love God with all of your heart, your soul, and strength, and love people as yourself. This is the primary way to be a biblical woman. Again, there's more overlap than there is difference. There's more similarity than there is distinction when we talk about men and women following God. 
with that understanding that for the most part, God calls men and women to do the same things, uh, I think there are some things that we notice in the first chapters of Genesis that give us some insight into what some of the distinctions uh, actually are biblically. So let's jump back into Genesis chapter 2. We'll start at verse 5, and I'll try to bring that out from some of the context in which Adam and Eve were created. Verse 5, it says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, there was no man to work the ground. That's important. That's the context. There was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So we'll talk about biblical masculinity first. First, we need, again, to understand the context in which he was created. There was no man to work the ground, and man was created out of that need, out of that, that lack of what was there as far as someone that God could give that responsibility to, to work the ground. And here's what it says about man's purpose before Eve even got there. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work, and, to work it and keep it. God wanted someone to come in and work and keep his creation. He wanted to give that responsibility to someone that he created. And so he creates Adam and it fills that need. Now that term to work, I mean, it can... It, it can be translated as to cultivate. It can mean to, to labor. So obviously putting work in, that term to keep, it means to take care of or to guard. To take care of or to guard. Adam was responsible for working in the garden to take care of it and keep it. So God creates Adam to do this. And part of, if, if you were to ask me, if a, if a brother were to ask me, again, as I'm answering that same question, what does it look like biblically to be a man? One of the things that I would say is, well, one of the things I would ask is, what, what are you responsible for? What, 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 are you, what is your garden, so to speak? Maybe there are already responsibilities that because of uh, something about your life that you are now responsible for. Maybe, or maybe if you, if you would tell me, I don't know if there's anything I'm responsible for. It's like, well, step number one, you need to find something that you are over and responsible for doing consistently time and time again. And I would say you need to work and keep whatever that is. You need to labor and you need to cultivate it to help it be as fruitful as possible, to help it, to, to, to cultivate it in such a way that it allows flourishing for whatever it is that you're responsible for. And then keep it. You are to protect it. You are to safe guard it. You are to take care of whatever it is that you are responsible for. Again, I'm not in any way saying that, 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 that women aren't to do this. Again, there's way more overlap. But if you want to lean into specifically what we see as the distinction between Adam and Eve, think, look at life and look at how you serve through the lens of working and keeping. Laboring, cultivating good, taking care of and guarding whatever it is that I am responsible for, whatever it is that you are responsible for. Now, when it comes to Eve being created, again, there was this need, and God created Eve to fill it. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. God said it wasn't good for Adam to be alone, but he wasn't just saying that it's not good for Adam to be alone romantically. You got to realize this, this dude is the only human on the earth at this time. God said that that wasn't good. He's going to need to make a helper that is fit for him. Now, it's interesting because that word helper is used to describe God more than it's used to describe anyone else in the Bible. So immediately, I'm like, well, God, couldn't you have been the helper yourself? That, that's one of the ways that you are referred to. The Holy Spirit in the New Testament even is referred to as the helper. But God was like, no, I'm going to make someone to be a helper. He's going to create someone that's fit to help Adam. That term helper that's used to describe Eve and God is a word for someone who brings what is necessary for someone in need or to help in some need. It's the same word that's used in Deuteronomy chapter 38, verse 29. It says this, happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help, that's the word, Isaiah, the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 2, and the sword of your triumph. Your enemies shall come fawning to you, and you shall tread upon their backs. So this term of, of a helper, or some translations use the term help me, this isn't like, oh, aren't you such a good helper? 
It's less of that. Think more of like the kind of help that God brings to those who need him. That woman was designed to bring that kind of help to those in need in God's world. The help that was needed, there was help that was needed. And God was like, Adam, I'm, I'm going to send someone to help you out. And she is going to image me and show off my character in the way that I come and bring help to my people. She will bring help to you. Continue reading Genesis chapter 2, 21 and 22. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place and flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. One thing that I think is important to note, that when Adam was made, he was given a purpose, he was given a mission, he was given a responsibility, while he was the only human being on the earth. Right? He was given that at that time. He, he, he had a purpose that was there. The, when Eve was created, it was inside of a relational context. That is one of the, the primary differences we see in the creation account, that when Eve was created, she was, it, it, it had to do with the relationship with Adam that she was in. And what's my point in bringing that up? One of the things that I've noticed as a pastor um, in our time, obviously, we care a lot about relationships in our church. It's one of the reasons we do life groups the way that we do. One of the things that I've, I, I think I started noticing a little bit at the beginning, but I've seen just continue to be the case over and over and over again uh, throughout the years is that at least in my experience, uh, the women who I know, tend, their well-being tends to um, be more greatly impacted and affected by the nature of the relationships that they're in. That when I noticed, one of the things that we, we started noticing with, uh, with men and women in life groups is that the, the struggles were often different in the brotherhood and the sisterhood uh, within the church. And, and, and asking a lot of questions of what that was, the, the best analogy I can, I, can, um, I can bring up or I can think of is that of a, uh, for those who are investors in the room, uh, you can invest in a, um, in a high risk investment account or a low risk investment account. A high-risk investment account, the highs are higher and the lows are lower. In a low-risk investment account, the highs are a little bit lower. There are still highs and the lows are, are, aren't quite as low. And what, what I believe I, I've seen is that, generally speaking, for women, the highs, as far as the, the ways relationships impact, impact the well-being, the highs seem to be higher and the lows seem to be lower. I believe that's largely because of the relational context in which Eve was created in the beginning, that the purpose of being a, a helper in a relational way seems to be deeply intertwined into the feminine soul. And if you look at the numbers, women tend to be, if you, if you were to just list off occupations that require someone with a high level of ability to come alongside someone else and be strong enough to provide the aid and whatever support it is that they need probably 10 out of 10 women are going to outnumber men in that field. You'll see, you see women far more prevalent. In, in, in my experience, women are far, uh, I would say, more gifted to more naturally and intuitively come alongside others and serve them and bless them and be a helper in the way that God helps his people in that way. So if a sister were to ask me, what does it mean for me to practice biblical femininity? After I told her to love God with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength and love people as herself, I'd say, When God opens a door, and when it is wise for you to do so, big caveat, when it is wise for you to do so, coming alongside those that could use your help, coming alongside those who won't be as good off without your presence and help in their life, and showing off the character of God as a helper by providing for them what is needed as you come alongside others, I would say is a way to live in a way that is in in step with what we see in the context of the creation account of Eve. And for men and women with these distinctions, and again, there's way more overlap than distinctions. You can do these things from your home, from your job, your relationships. You can do it in your life group. You can do this in our church. Whatever God has for you, for men, having eyes to see how do I work and keep wherever God has me. For women, how can I be, how can I be one who, who helps in the way that God helps? And I believe that is a pathway to living in a way that is that is connected with the design and the context that we see from the creation of Adam and Eve. So hear me on this. As I go over some of the distinctions, here's one of the main points I also wanted to make. Men and women are distinct and equal. Men and women are distinct and equal. 
It is possible to be different and be equal in value, be equal in dignity, to be equal in worth, even though there are differences and distinctions that we have. Men and women are distinct and equal. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God created male and female in his image. If you like Latin phrases that theologians use, the term is the imago Dei. In God's image, we are made to show off his glory in a way that no other aspect of his creation is designed to do. This ascribes great dignity to both men and women. They are distinct but equal. And there's nothing in scripture that indicates that either one is better or smarter or more needed or more valuable or more important than the other. Both are created in God's image. More evidence of their equality. Genesis I'm sorry, we'll go jump down to verse 28, excuse me. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. This is a huge uh, part of the command in the Bible that I don't know if we pay a whole lot of attention to, but it says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and over the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Who did he give dominion over the animals and over the earth to? It was both of them, Adam and Eve. And here at the conclusion of the creation account in Genesis, they stand together at the pinnacle of God's creation as image bearers of God. So brothers and sisters, let's be sure to honor and look out for each other. Brothers and sisters, let us be sure to honor and look out for each other. Men, let us be intentional or let us intentionally be an encouragement to our sisters. Sisters, look to intentionally be an encouragement to your brothers. Now, keep it appropriate, uh, but we can still be an encouragement to each other. Our church, you know, we have an emphasis, uh, especially in our life groups, uh, on being transparent, being able to be vulnerable with each other. I believe that the Bible calls us to do so, and also I found it to be immensely helpful in my life and in the lives of so many others when we can be honest with each other about where we are, how we're doing, what's going on in our lives, confess sins to each other, confess wins and celebration, or share wins and celebration with each other, uh, and come alongside each other and encourage each other. Now, because of, of that emphasis on that, we create some times and spaces within our life groups where men are together and women are together because we believe that makes it a lot easier and oftentimes it makes it uh, more helpful to talk about a lot of the things that we have to talk about. But I want to make sure that we don't fall into the trap that I've seen some churches like us fall into when we do have those separate spaces where many seem to have arrived at the conclusion of, if I'm a man, then the, one that, the ones that I'm supposed to be intentional about encouraging are men. And if I'm a woman, then the one that I'm supposed to be intentional about encouraging is just strictly women. When the Bible points us to no such thing, well, the Bible nev never indicates that in any way. When you talk about the fellowship of believers, there are men and there are women together, and we, have, we need each other. And to not believe, I would say, to not believe that God, if I'm a man and I believe that I don't believe that God would have me to be an encouragement to my sisters in Christ, I would believe is, in, is, a, is a doubting of the fact that I'm made in the image of God. And if you do not believe that someone of a different gender than you can be an encouragement to you and help you in your walk with Christ, I would say it's a doubting of the fact that they are made in the image of God, made to represent him in the earth. Again, I do believe it's good for us to have those gender-specific times from time to time, but at the same time, the Bible calls us to be in fellowship with one another and encourage one another and pray for one another, and it doesn't tell men to just do those things with men, and it doesn't tell women to just do those things with women. No, it's talking about all believers, and it tells them to do those things with, tells us to do these things with each other. And family, make no mistake, we need each other in this Christian walk. We need each other in this Christian walk. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 I already read it once. I'll go through it again and point out something different. 1 Corinthians 11, 11 through 12 says this. Nevertheless, in the Lord, so it's talking for us who are following Christ, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. So in this specific passage, his main focus, he's talking about marriage, he's talking about headship, and a way for wives to honor their husbands in the church. 
Well, what I want to point out from this verse is kind of how he's rooting his argument, the, the argument that he's making about that specifically to married couples. He points out how dependent men and women are on each other. He, he brings this, this, this part of scripture up as if to say, hey, don't forget that y'all need each other. And you can see it from, the, from in the creation of Eve, and you can see it from how all of us are born, that God designed for men and women to need each other. I think he's bringing this up to help us see that God created us to need each other and serve and bless each other. This is how God designed the relationship between these two kinds of image bearers to work out in his creation. Men in here, in order for you to be who God created you to be, you need Christian women in your life to be a part of God's process in transforming you. In order for you to be who God created you to be, I'm just going to try to get a couple more amens. That's why I'm saying it again. Men in here, in order for you to be who God created you to be, you need Christian women in your life to be a part of God's process of transforming you. Women are made in the image of God, and God wants to use the Christian women in your life to grow you as you live in fellowship with them. Amen. Amen. Women in the room. In order for you to be who God created you to be, you need, you need Christian men in your life to be a part of God's process in transforming you. Men are made in God's image, and God wants to use the Christian men in your life to grow you as you live in fellowship with them. Yeah. Amen. I appreciate that. The Apostle Paul says, in the Lord, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man nor man of woman. He's saying if you are in the Lord, God does not want you to see yourself as needing to be independent of the other gender. That's what he's saying to them. I don't want you to view yourself as, as, as being able to be who you are supposed to be, independent of if you're a man, independent of women, if you're a woman, independent of men. And I think it's important for us to note this because sometimes in our world today, there's a lot of conversation that men have about women and that women have about men that isn't honoring to each other. Conversation that doesn't acknowledge the fact that we're all made in the image of God. That's why we're talking about this today when we're in Genesis chapter one, chapter two. Conversation that doesn't acknowledge the fact that we are both made in the image of God. Men in the room, I want to talk to the men who are grown ups. I want to talk to the young men. I want to talk to high schoolers, middle schoolers, preteens in the room who will be men someday. Many of us have been in conversations where women have been spoken about in derogatory and dishonoring ways. Be careful. Be careful how you respond in those conversations. Man, women be. Man, that's a woman for you. You know women be. Be careful. Be careful. Because often, because often what comes next is very dishonoring. Rather than showing honor to our sisters, I've heard men, not in this church specifically, belittle women in disgusting and shameful ways. I've heard men dismiss women's very valid thoughts for whatever reason, as if men don't, as, as if men have a superior view and perspective on things that are actually going on. I've heard men describe women as being overly emotional, as if men don't get overly emotional. What are we talking about? And what can happen in those conversations, what can happen in those conversations oftentimes is if there's a group of men talking, it can become a conversation where all the men who tend to see things from one perspective dismiss the thoughts of women made in the image of God, whom God has gifted in such a way that they might view things in a, from a different perspective whose thoughts are just as valuable as yours, but because you're just around a bunch of men and a bunch of guys talking, now all the men are at the conclusion that we know more and women don't know what they're talking about. It's dishonoring. It, it doesn't, amen. It's dishonoring, and it doesn't honor the fact that men and women are both made in the image of God, and we are different, but we are equal. 
women in the room. Young women, high schoolers, middle schoolers, preteens, and all who will be a woman someday. I know, I know that there are conversations that take place in our society where men are talked down on in, dis, in derogatory and dishonoring ways. Be very careful how you respond when you hear a woman say something like, yeah, you know men are like that. They always blank. Well, you know that's a man for you. You know that's how, you know that's how they do. You know that's how they do. Be careful because oftentimes what comes next is dishonoring rather, rather than honoring to our brothers. I've heard of women, not necessarily in our church, belittle men in demeaning, disgusting, and shameful ways, speaking about men as if men are lazy and irresponsible in a way that is dishonoring to those who bear the image of God right alongside you. And what can happen in those conversations is women all weigh in on the same thing and see things from a woman's perspective and disregard the man's perspective as if the man is not also made in the image of God. Might we be careful to understand that though we are different, though we see things oftentimes very differently, both men and women are made in God's image. Husbands in the room. If you're with men and the guy brings up something that his wife does that is frustrating to him, be very careful what comes out of your mouth next. If he brings up, if he says something that his wife does that is, that is frustrating to him, especially if you've experienced similar things, be very careful what comes out of your, wife, your, your mouth next. Be very careful about how you respond, about, respond or talk about your wife when she is not there. Don't allow those conversations to turn into a time of bashing wives or women. Wives in a room. If you're with a group of women and, and a wife brings up something that her husband does that is very frustrating to her, be very careful how you respond. If you're <laughs> Be very careful how you respond if your husband does something similar that is frustrating to you. Don't allow those conversations to turn into a bashing of husbands or men in general. It is easy for those conversations to turn that way on either side. Might we be a church where we uplift each other, where we honor each other, where men are encouraged by the sisters in the church, where the sisters are encouraged and uplifted by the brothers in the church, where we pray for each other and stand up for each other, where we stand united with each other. May that be true of us. May we, may we show off the wisdom and glory of God by how united we are as men and women in the church, knowing that we were made in the image of God together, standing together at the pinnacle of God's creation as his image bearers to create good and cultivate good in the world in the way that God has designed us. I just got one more verse for you before I close today. One more verse, one more verse. <laughs> First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. It reads, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you, that's what we'll focus on, of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. In this passage, obviously, Peter's instructing husbands on how to treat their wives, and it's one of the passages in the Bible that communicates the fact that we are created different but equal as much as any that I know of in the New Testament. You got to understand the cultural context that Peter is writing to. At this time, women's word oftentimes wasn't even seen as valid in court. That means men oftentimes were able to be verbally or physically abusive to their wives and not have to answer for it, not have to give an account for it. I'm going to say this as a side. The end of that verse what Peter is saying is that if you don't live with your wife in an understanding way, God ain't listening to your prayers. This is what actually he's saying at the end of this verse. He's saying, you ain't going to treat my daughter that way and then think I'm just going to listen to you for what you're asking for. That's what he's saying at the end of that verse. So he's saying there's, there's accountability for that. That's not my main point in this. In this culture, men would oftentimes use their physical strength to intimidate their wives. 
And a lot of a lot of you know the the, the commentators and theologians, theologians they go back and forth about what is meant by the weaker vessel. My understanding of this verse in the we, in First Peter chapter three verse seven, when he's talking about the weaker vessel, he's saying that women, generally speaking, don't have the same amount of physical strength as men do. So you need to live. You need to remember that and live in a way that is understanding of her. You need to understand that that is the case. So be careful in how you deal with her. Don't use intimidation. Don't don't, don't try to threaten abuse in the way that you interact with your wife. But that's the main point that I want to say about this is what he says when he talks about since they are heirs with you. The, the, the Greek term there can be translated as joint heirs with you of the grace of life. So he doesn't just say don't harm her. He says be understanding and show honor to her, which again would have been very much against the cultural norms. But when he says that she is a joint heir or that she is an heir with you. See, at that time, women, especially if there was a man present, especially if she had a brother, they, they, they rarely received an inheritance from the possessions of the father. The men, generally speaking, owned the land, they owned the estate, and it was passed down to the men. So when he's saying that she is a joint heir with you, this is a countercultural statement and showing how the kingdom of God is different from the kingdom that they are growing up in and that they are living in. He's actually saying... Hey, I know y'all are different, but y'all are of equal value in the kingdom of God. She is a joint heir with you. She is a co-heir with you. That when God saves you, she's receiving the same salvation that you're receiving. That she's receiving the same grace that you're receiving. That God is dignifying her the same way that he dignifies you. That God is blessing her the same way that he is blessing you. You are different. You are distinct, but you are equal. He says, in the kingdom of God, all who have placed faith in Christ, all of God's children receive the inheritance of his grace. All of us will inherit the kingdom of God. Essentially, Peter is showing the equal dignity and value of both men and women by saying that we're all receiving the same grace and the same kingdom and the same inheritance from God. One is not better than the other. One is not worse than the other. Man and woman, Ish and Isha, both created in the image of God. And if in Christ, both receiving the same grace and inheritance from God. And one of the things, I don't know if you've ever considered it this way or thought about it this way. But we actually celebrate that together each week as we partake in communion together. Men and women, image bearers of God in Christ, joint heirs of his grace, going together to the same table, enjoying the same grace, celebrating the same Savior who shed his blood for all of God's children, for all who have placed faith in him, because he loves both of us equally. I'll pray for us and we'll partake in communion.